Chapter Twenty of the Exploits of Juve by Marcella Lane and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty, The Arrest of Josephine. The somewhat grim faces of Madame Guignon, Julie, and the flirt lit up suddenly. Bonzeal, the tramp set free by the police the day after the drive in the Rue Charbonnier, had opened the bottle of vermouth, and Josephine bustled around to find glasses to put on the table. Josephine had visitors in her little lodging. There was to be a quiet lunch. On the sideboard, attractive dishes were ready. A fine savor of cooking onions came from the dark corner in which Lupart's pretty mistress was doing hasty cookery over the gas. Neat or with water? asked Bonzeal performing his office of cupbearer with comical dignity. Madame Guignol asked for plenty of water. Julie shrugged her shoulders indifferently. She didn't care so long as there was drink. While the flirt, in her cracked voice, breathed in the loafer's ear, How about a sip of brandy to put with it? The appetizer loosened tongues. They began to cackle. From a drawer, Josephine got out a pack of cards, which the flirt promptly seized, while Julie, leading familiarly on her shoulder, counseled her, Cut with the left, and watch what you are doing. We shall see if there is any luck for us in the pack. Josephine had now been back three days from her painful journey, and had not seen Lupart. The latter, after having abandoned the motor in some waste ground among the fortifications, had vanished with the beard, only bidding his mistress go home as if nothing had happened, and wait for news of him. The Simplon Express affair had made a great stir in the fashionable world, and had produced considerable uneasiness among the criminal class. To be sure, no name had been mentioned, and apparently the police were not following any definite clue. Still in the chapel quarter, and especially in the den of the Guat d'Or, and the Rue de Chartres, it was noticed that the absence of the chief members of the band of ciphers coincided with the date of the tragedy. At first there had been some slight standoffishness shown to Josephine on her return. She was greeted with doubtful allusions, equivocal compliments, and a touch of coldness, and folks were also amazed at not seeing Lupart reappear with her. Josephine told herself that she must at all costs disabuse her neighbors of this bad impression, and that is why she had decided to give a luncheon party to her most intimate friends. These might also be her most formidable opponents, for such damsels as the flirt and Julie, even big Ernestine, could not fail to be jealous of the mistress of a distinguished leader. Besides, she was the prettiest woman in the quarter. Joining the conversation from time to time, Josephine smiled and regained confidence. Her maneuver bade fair to be crowned with success. As they sat down at table, the door opened, and Mother Toulouche came in, carrying a capacious basket. Well, cried the old fence, I got wind that something was going on here, and I said to myself, why shouldn't Mother Toulouche be in it as well? One more or less don't matter, eh, Josephine? Josephine assented and made room for her. Before sitting down, the old woman put her basket on the floor. If I invite myself, Fafine, I bring something to the feast. Here are some Portugals and two dozen snails which will help out. All at once, Josephine, who despite the general gaiety, was absent-minded and preoccupied, rose and ran to the door, answering a knock. She was at bottom horribly uneasy at hearing nothing of her lover. She began to fear that the police for once might have got the upper hand. It was little Poilat, the porter's son, who rushed in quite out of breath. Madame Josephine, mother told me to come up and warn you that two gentlemen were asking for you in the lodge just now. Two gentlemen in special rig. Do you know them, Poilat? I don't, Madame Josephine. What do they want of me? They didn't say. What did your mother answer? Don't know. Believe she told them you were in your den. The occurrence cast a chill over the company. Little Polat was given a big glass of claret, and when he had left, the flirt observed gravely, It's the cops. Why should they come and inquire for me? Julie tried to console her. Anyhow, they'll not come up to your place. Josephine was greatly upset. Were they after her or Lupart? Why had they withdrawn? Would they come back? In a flash, she burst out, beating her fist on the table. Bah! I've had enough of this, not knowing what is going to happen from one moment to the next. Sooner than stay here, I'll go and find out. The flirt suggested with a spiteful smile, Go ahead, my girl. 
They won't be far away. Go and ask them what they want. Very well, cried Josephine. I will. And the young girl emptied her glass to give her courage. And if you don't come back, we'll set your room to rights, cried the flirt after her. Good luck. Try not to sleep in the jug. Josephine rushed downstairs, and then after a moment's hesitation, turned and went down the Rue de Chartres. At first she noticed nothing unusual or suspicious. The faces of those she met were mostly familiar to her. But suddenly her heart stopped beating. Two men accosted her simultaneously, one on the right, the other on her left. Her neighbor on the right asked very softly, Are you Josephine Rameau? Yes. You must come with us. Yes, said Josephine resigned. A few moments later, Josephine, seated in a cab between the two men, was crossing Paris. The detectives had given the address Boulevard du Palais. Lupart's mistress, taken on her arrival to the anteroom adjoining the private rooms of the examining magistrates, had not much time for reflection. To be sure, she was not guilty. Not guilty? Well, at bottom the affair of the Marseille train made Josephine uneasy and the story of the motor, too, the motor taken by force from unknown travelers, what knowledge had the police of these events? When questioned, was she to confess or deny? A little old man, bald and fussy, appeared at the end of the passage and called her. Josephine Rameau, the private room of Justice Fusilier. Mechanically, she went forward between her two captors, who pushed her into a well-lit apartment, in the corner of which stood a big desk. A well-dressed gentleman was sitting there, writing. Opposite him, in the shadow, someone stood motionless. The magistrate raised his head. His face was cold and contained, but not spiteful. "'What is your name?' "'Josephine Rameau.' "'Where were you born?' "'Rue de Belleville.' "'What is your age?' Twenty-two. "'You live by prostitution?' Josephine colored, and, with an angry voice, cried, no your honor i have a calling i am a polisher are you working now josephine felt awkward well to say the truth at the moment i have no work but they know me at monsieur Maltier's rue de malt it was there that i was apprenticed and and since you became the mistress of the ruffian lupart known as the square you have ceased to practice an honest calling i won't deny being lupart's mistress but as for prostitution the man Josephine had noticed standing in the shadow came forward and murmured a few words in the magistrate's ear. "'Monsieur Juve!' cried Josephine, moving toward the inspector with her hand out. She stopped short, as the detective motioned to her that such a familiarity was not allowed, and the examination was resumed. The magistrate, after having by some curt questions brought to light the salient points of Josephine's life, and clearly mapped out the speedy development of the honest little work girl into a ruffian's mistress and in all probability accomplice began the interrogation on the main point at some length he narrated without losing a single change of her countenance the various incidents of the evening begun in the railway which ended with the disaster to the simplon express fusilier made josephine pass again through her headlong exit from l'herboisiere her quick passage through paris when she was barely convalescent and still suffering from the effects of the fever her departure in the Marseille Express, where she picked up half a score of footpads headed by her redoubtable lover, then the waiting in the silence of the night, the affray, the threats, and lastly, after breaking the couplings to the train, the dangerous flight of the band, the headlong rush through the country. The magistrate wound up. You came to town afterwards, Josephine Rameau, in company with Lupart, called the Square, and his factotum, the ruffian Beard. Josephine, embarrassed by the steady glance of the magistrate, endeavored to keep her face devoid of expression, but as in his recital the points of the adventure she had shared grew more definite, she felt she was constantly changing color, and at certain moments her eyelids quivered over her downcast eyes. Evidently he was well posted. That young man who got into the same compartment as Monsieur Marte must certainly have belonged to the police. But for that, the judge would never have known precisely what took place. Decidedly, this was a bad beginning. Josephine now dreaded to see the door open and Lupart appear, the bracelets on his wrists, followed by the beard similarly fettered, 
for beyond a doubt the two men had been nabbed. Hunched up, her nerves tense, Josephine kept her mind fixed on one point. She was waiting anxiously for the first chance to protest. At a certain juncture, the magistrate declared, You three, Lupart, the Beard, and yourself, shared between you the proceeds of the robberies committed. As soon as she could get a word in, Josephine shouted her innocence. As to that, no. She had not touched the scent of the business. She did not even know what was involved. The exact truth was this. She was ill in the hospital, when all of a sudden she remembered that Lupart had some days before bidden her be at all costs at the Lyon station on a certain Saturday evening at exactly seven o'clock. Now that particular Saturday was the day after the attempt on her life. As she was much better, she set off in obedience to her lover. She knew no more. She had done no more. She would not have them accuse her of any more. The young woman had gradually grown warm. Her voice rose and vibrated. The judge let her have her say, and when she had finished, there was a silence. Monsieur Fusilier slowly dipped a pen in the ink, and in his level voice declared, casting a glance in Jou's direction, After all, what seems clearly established is complicity. Josephine gave a start. She knew the terrible significance of the term. Complicity meant joint guilt. But Juve intervened. Excuse me. In place of complicity, perhaps we had better say compulsion. I don't follow you, Juve. We must bear in mind, Your Honor, that this girl is to be pardoned to a certain extent for having obeyed her lover's orders, more particularly at a time when the latter had gained quite a victory over the police. For in spite of the protection of our people, his attempt against her partially succeeded. Taken aback, Monsieur Fusilier looked from the detective to the young woman whom he regarded as guilty. Juve's outburst seemed to him out of place. Your pardon, Juve, but your reasoning seems to me somewhat specious. However, I will not press this charge against the girl. We have something better. Turning to Lupart's mistress, the judge asked abruptly, What has become of Lady Beltham? Josephine was amazed by the question. She turned inquiring eyes toward Juve, who quickly said, Monsieur Fusilier, this is not the moment. The magistrate, dropping this line, again tackled Josephine on her relations with Lupart. In a flash, Josephine made up her mind. She would simulate innocence at all costs. With the craft of a consummate actress, she began in a low voice, which gradually rose and became impressive, insinuating. How pitiful it is to think that everyone bears a grudge against a poor girl who, some day in springtime, has given herself the pleasure of a lover. Is there any harm in giving oneself to the man who loves you? Who forbids it? No one but the priests, and they have been kicked out of doors. The magistrate could not help smiling, and Juve showed signs of amusement. But I am honest, and when I understand something of what was going on, I wrote to Monsieur Juve, and what thanks did I get? two bullet holes in my skin monsieur fusilier hesitated about turning his summons into a committal end of chapter twenty